the first thing that I found when I began to look into Islam is that Muslims believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. The second thing I found out about Islam was that Muslims believe in one God. And they did not compromise on that. They believed in Tawheed and they would not budge. And I began to read through one which was about the miracles of the Quran. This was showing, Allah is saying, this book that I have could be from nobody but Allah. And as soon as I had finished reading it, Alhamdulillah, I said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, at this time, I would like you to join me in welcoming to the stage Brother Musa. Musa Sarantonio was born in Melbourne, Australia. He is from a family of six and converted to Islam at age 17. He is the proud father of two daughters, Aisha and Sophia. He has been a Muslim for five years and is currently studying history and communications with aspirations of becoming an instructor. Currently, he is the president of the Islamic Society of Victoria University in Melbourne, Australia. Brothers and sisters, I invite Brother Musa Sarantonio to take the podium and address us on the subject of From Darkness to Light. Brother Musa, the podium is yours. In Alhamdulillah, in Alhamdulillah, he was Salatu was Salamu ala Rasulillah, he was Ali, he was Habi Ajmain. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatu. Jazakallah khaira, Brother Isa, for the introduction. Basically, to begin, uh, as the brother mentioned, five years ago I embraced Islam. And I'm sure you're all wondering what was it that brought me to Islam? Was it my own reading about Islam? Was it Muslims who gave da'wah to Islam? You know, what, how was it that I came to Islam? So inshallah, I'm going to try and cover all of those aspects. What was it about Islam that appealed to me? What was it from the Muslims that brought me to Islam? What were the major overlying causes? So that inshallah, not only do you hear my story, but you can take lessons from it, inshallah. To begin, I was born in Melbourne, Australia, to an Italian father and a mother of Italian heritage. And for those who know anything about those two countries, Italy and Ireland, they are the two most staunch nations in following Roman Catholicism. Now growing up, I always considered since Christianity, by numbers, is the largest religion in the world, slightly larger than Islam. And Roman Catholicism is the largest of those groups within Christianity. So in the same way, Islam has groups like Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah. Roman Catholicism is one of those groups within Christianity. So I always figured since we're from the largest group of the largest religion in the world, we must be on the truth. I mean, looking at those numbers, more people belong to our faith than anyone else in the world. That should be a testimony to the truth. So I always grew up not even doubting in the slightest that me, my family, my church, my faith were correct. Just a side note, however, for the Muslims, Alhamdulillah, looking at numbers, and the sects of certain religions, the largest in the world is actually that of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, of the Sunnis. MashaAllah, those who are we are part of, Alhamdulillah. So even if we want to go by numbers, we are on the truth, Alhamdulillah. However, my family, even though we considered ourselves to be on the truth, we weren't very, very practicing. Whilst we were Catholic or Christian by name, we didn't really do much. We didn't go to church except on Christmas or Easter or when somebody died or when someone was getting married. And by all means, religion was not part of our family. So um, even though I went to a Catholic primary school, even while we were there, the certain area in which Melbourne I live, you will find very, very few Australian or white or Anglo or Caucasian people. The majority are from Chinese, African, Indian backgrounds. So even in our primary school, the Christians were a minority. So while we came to our religion class to appease the other ethnic groups, we'd spend as much time studying Buddhism or something else rather than Christianity. However, when we did look at Christianity, when we would read the Bible, when we would learn about a religion, when we would talk about God, you know, I'd really love it. I'd hear all of these stories of these great messengers of Allah. Jesus, peace be upon him. Moses, peace be upon him. 
Ibrahim alayhi salam, all of these, I used to really love it. You know, I'd hear it and it would really touch my heart. However, I never had the access to actually turning that love into action. Because as I said, we didn't go to church. We didn't do any activities with our religion. It was just left at that. They said, you're a Christian and be proud of it. And basically for us, that was it. Now, once I'd finished primary school and you get into secondary school, I'm sure many of you know those uh, years, you know, early puberty, you've got all of the, all this, you know, action inside of you, all of these hormones raging. So you spend most of your time going out with friends, going to nightclubs, doing this, drinking alcohol. Many of my friends later, as we got older, they'd start taking drugs. And I know for myself and a few of my other friends, because we had that religious background, we'd always, you know, we'd draw a line somewhere. So whilst we do a little bit of badness, we'd always refrain from other things. So we'd always identify ourselves by that. We were the ones who sort of knew our limits. Now, at that same time, it didn't stop all of us. Eventually, you get sucked in when you're in that environment. The ones who would say, no, I'm only going to drink a little bit. By time, they would get into doing softer drugs, then harder drugs. And I've seen many of my friends Muslims as well, doing drugs such as cocaine, speed, heroin. And I'd look and I'd say, you know, how can these people be doing this? How can they be damaging their bodies? Because I'd say for myself, you know, my religion tells me not to do that and I'd keep away from it. So whilst I was going through this, I'd still have that religious identity. I'd draw the line somewhere. While I'd have girlfriends, I would never fall into zina. I'd always say, no, I, I can't go there because it's something that Allah doesn't want for me. I'd always be able to stop myself that little bit. And I always had a few close friends who would always feel that same way. Now, at that same time, whilst you know I had that faith in my heart, going to secondary school, and especially my secondary school, was, very, uh, it was a very political school. And it was run by people who follow a methodology, a belief called socialism or communism. So it was a very liberal school. Out of all of the schools in our city, we were the only ones who didn't have uniforms. We wouldn't call the teacher Mr. Smith. We just call him John. It was very lax. We didn't have any fences around our school. There was no bells. So you see, they wanted to really instill in us a sense of freedom. Now this is one thing which really damaged me. Coming from a Catholic primary school, going into all of this freedom, man, I loved it. They said, you don't have to work if you don't want to. So I simply wouldn't work. You tell a kid he doesn't have to, he won't. But the one thing they would try and instill in us was a sense of following politics. And I'd say, well, if everything in our life is supposed to be about politics, let me do justice to it. Let me read about it. So they say to us, you know, you should follow socialism, the opposite of which is conservative politics, the most extreme of which is Nazism. So I'd get into my class and the teacher would be giving, you know, his or her beliefs about this. And I would say, you know, I believe in Hitler and what Hitler said, just to enrage her. And they'd really go crazy. So I'd say this was something very close to people's hearts. So when all of the socialist parties used to come to our high school, I'd always be arguing with them. Even though sometimes I'd sit with them and I'd find some truth in what they said, or I'd sit with the people on the far right of the politics, I'd see what, some truth in what they said. When I'd ultimately argue with them, I always found the topic of argument returning to religion. I'd talk to these socialist people and they would say the most, the worst things, words I cannot even repeat about their hate for religion. They would speak about Maryam, about Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him, in the most vulgar terms, because generally they are atheists. And I think, how can someone abuse religion and abuse myself as such? What is it that makes them hate it so much? And I'd speak to them and they'd say, we believe that religion is the opiate of the people. This is what Karl Marx said in his book, The Communist Manifesto. It's something which numbs the people. It's a false belief which gives them some sense of security. And we see one of the uh, most famous philosophers in the Western world, he had a similar ideology. His name was Friedrich Nietzsche. And Friedrich Nietzsche, what he had said, he said, we as humans, we created God. We were the one who gave life to God. And now God is dead. These were his words. He said, God is dead. And I think, how can he say such a statement? What essentially he was saying is, we as humans, being so weak at a certain point of time, we created a God to give some sense of meaning to our life. And now, after the so-called enlightenment, which was nothing but enlightenment, rather it was sending us into darkness, turning us away from the truth. At this time, we got rid of God. We didn't need him anymore, so we killed him off.
and I always responded to them. I said, you can go to Frederick Nietzsche's home country and you can see his grave there. It says Frederick Nietzsche. And I tell you, Frederick Nietzsche is dead and God is living and eternal. Alhamdulillah. People, they claim such things. He says God is dead. Rather, he is dead. So you can understand, I was very enraged by what these people would be saying, bringing these ideologies. And when I would ultimately argue with them, they had nothing to stand upon. They would say, you know, it's a fallacy to believe in God. There's contradictions in all of these beliefs. And I'd ask them for their proof, and every single time they would be wrong. So I felt an amazing sense of attachment to my belief. But ultimately, in my heart, I thought, I really don't know that much about my belief. I'm willing to fight for it. And there were times where we physically had to fight for our belief. There were times in high school where people would amazingly offend us and it would come to blows. It was that serious sometimes. So I thought, the least I can do is read about my religion, if I'm willing to fight for it so much. So the first thing I did was I went home and I grabbed the Bible and I opened from page one. And you have to understand, going to a Catholic primary school, they only show you certain verses of the Bible because the Bible is not a very light book. So they'd say, you know, read only this page and that page. So when I started to read it for myself, it was quite a big shock. Anyone who's read through the Bible, and I'm sure Dr. Zakir Naik has mentioned many such things, as is Ahmadi that rahimahullah. Some of the stories in the Bible from the very beginning, they are very lewd. They are almost pornographic, if you like. So as a young kid reading these verses, I thought, hold on, this is the word of God? This is amazing. Like you hear the story of Lut alayhi salam and Lut alayhi salam, or Lot as they call him in the Bible, he is innocent of such claims. They mentioned that his daughters withdrew from him, from the society, and they lived up in the mountains. And it mentions because they had such urges, they got their father drunk and they commit zina with him. A'udhu billah. So you can understand, coming across these verses, this is something I've never heard before. This is a side of religion which I never thought existed. But the main shock was when I was going through a book of the Bible which is called the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy is basically a set of laws which was given to Musa alayhi salam, to Moses. Some of these laws were as follows. I would say that God was saying to the people, you should grow your beards. You should not shave. And I thought that's very strange because if you see the Pope, if you see our local priest, if you see basically any Catholic on the face of the earth, they're always clean shaven. Now, what's this thing about growing a beard? Then it was saying that you should not become drunk. You should not you know, drink alcohol. I'm thinking, but hold on, when we go to our church every Sunday, the priest actually gives us wine to drink. And it also said that you should not eat pork. You should not eat from a pig. And I thought, Ajib, this is, this is really amazing because again, every Christian I know, it's like the most Christian thing you can do. Sit down and eat pork. They love it, especially Italians. It's like their staple meal. So I thought, where did this come from? How could it be that God is saying something, yet we're doing something different? And in the back of my mind, I always remembered, you know, like I knew Jews didn't eat pork. And I had some Muslim friends growing up. And basically their religion to me was the fact that they didn't eat pork. That was the one thing which really, you know, made them uh, describe them, that they didn't eat pork. So I thought, well, they're not doing it. And our Bible's telling us not to do it. So I'm going to stop doing it. That's it. I'm not like, God has told us this, so I will stop doing it. So as soon as I started doing these things, and I also tried to grow my beards, you know, I could never grow it too much. It would always get to annoy me a little bit. But alhamdulillah, as you can see, now it's growing. At that time, you know, I started to do this. And all of my uh, family, some of who claimed to be, you know, religious practicing Christians, they said to me, why are you growing your beard? Why won't you eat pork? Why won't you drink alcohol? And I'd say, well, the Bible says so. And they'd say to me, well, no, no, that's in the Old Testament. We follow the New Testament. I'd say, how is it that you can reject part of what God says? and only accept some. Like I'd say to them, do you accept homosexuality? And they'd say, no, of course not. I said, well, that's in the Old Testament. What do you say to that? And they wouldn't know what to say. And I'd say, you're hypocrites. All of you are all hypocrites. You're only taking from what is easy for you. And Alhamdulillah, that's one thing which later on impressed me about the Muslims. They wouldn't pick and take. Even if they drank alcohol, for example, they wouldn't say that it was halal. They would say, Allah said it haram, and may Allah make it easy for me to stay away from such a thing. So that was one thing, alhamdulillah, which was good about the Muslims. So uh, around that time, in uh, the year 2000, I actually visited the Vatican. Now, the Vatican is a place in Italy, in Rome, and this is the seat of Roman Catholicism. Now, once I got there, it was the year 2000, the year of the Jubilee, as they called it. And they've got a special door within St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And this door is called La Porta Santa, or the Holy Door. And they say, when you walk through this door, all your sins are forgiven. And I thought, 
wow, just walking through a door, all of our sins are forgiven? Where did this come from? Like, I'd question it. I didn't, I didn't care what the Pope said. I didn't care what they were telling us. I'd say, where in the Bible does this come from? Where did the Pope get this authority? In history, they would constantly contradict themselves. They'd say one thing, then do another thing. How can they claim to be infallible? These are humans. We only follow what God says, which made me a stranger amongst the Christians. But the biggest surprise was actually once I'd got inside of the door. The first thing I was greeted by in the corner was the body of one of the dead popes. And what they had done is they had embalmed this pope so his body would survive throughout the ages and coated it in gold. And what the people were doing was coming up and praying to this dead body. Billah, they were praying to a dead body. And I'm looking at, and I'm thinking, this is supposed to be a place which is the home of my religion. Yet I feel so uncomfortable. What are these people doing? How can you be praying to a dead body? Then I'd see there was a statue once you get past that. And people were rubbing the feet of this statue. And they'd say, when you rub the feet, you make a wish. I'm thinking, Gajib, this is idol worship at the supposed home of my faith. You go on a little bit further and you see, A'udhu Billah, there's a place within the Vatican called the Sistine Chapel. I'm sure many of you would have seen pictures of it. They call it like the pinnacle of Renaissance art. Within there, what it is, is you look up at the roof and there's a massive uh, painting of all of the stages of creation. And the centerpiece of this is a picture of God himself and Adam alayhi salam. Now I studied at least enough to know the Ten Commandments. The second of which is you should not make pictures, you should not make images of your Lord. Yet in the, in the Sistine Chapel within the Vatican we see a picture of God. And all he is is an old man with a long grey beard. Is this who you're worshipping? You're told not to make images of your God. And now you're going and doing such things? Again, this is idol worship. And I felt in my heart that this, it's not right. Even though I've grown up being told this is what I'm supposed to believe, I reject it. So around that same time, I called myself a non-denominational Christian. I was someone who believed in God and you know, I didn't follow any certain church. So I felt really disassociated from all Christians. And it was around this time that I started to read about other religions, not out of interest, you know, uh, that I was searching for something that I needed. I was just interested in reading. So I read about Hinduism, about Buddhism, about this religion, Shintoism, Zoroastrianism, but I never looked into Islam. It was only after some time that I met a Muslim friend of mine, and subhanAllah, look at how much he loved Islam. He said, nice to meet you, my name is so-and-so, would you like to become Muslim? MashaAllah, how many of us have started a conversation like that? Now, I assume very uh, little of the time someone would actually say, yes, I'd love to. But alhamdulillah, it opened the doors to da'wah. I knew this guy's a Muslim. If I want to know about Islam, I'll ask a question to him. And so I would. And he'd always be telling me about Islam. And one time I remember he actually gave me a book. It was a very big book. I can't remember what it was. But for all I knew, it was the Qur'an. And I used to keep it in my room, even though I'd never read it. And one day my brother actually found it and he said, what's this? It must be the Qur'an. So he took it outside and him and his friends, they burnt it. A'udhu Billah. This is the hatred that people had for Islam. So even though I knew nothing about it, you'd understand I wouldn't want to join this religion because look at how much the people hate it. Who'd want to join something like that so therefore your family will turn against you, therefore your friends will turn against you? So of course I had no doubt in my mind, you know, I'm happy where I am. But uh, after some time again, I had another Muslim friend and subhanAllah, because of his ignorance, he came from one of the countries which used to be a communist state. So then they'd been robbed of their Islam by their leaders. And he, out of his ignorance, started abusing Jesus, peace be upon him. He instantly assumed, you know, our prophet is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and your prophet is Jesus alayhi wa So he began to attack him. And I was very upset at this. So I thought, man, I'm going to go home, I'm going to do my research, and I'm going to find out about his religion, and I'm going to attack him. So ultimately, I wanted to look into Islam so that I could discredit it. And subhanAllah, the first thing that I found when I began to look into Islam was that Muslims believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. And this is quite a shock. Like I thought, hold on. The thing that I'm looking for is the fact that they don't believe in Jesus, yet this is saying that they do believe in Jesus. So I thought, maybe it's a mistake. So I went to another website. I checked that. It says, yes, they believe in Jesus. They believe in Moses. They believe in all of the prophets that I did. And I thought, well... And I've been on this earth for about what, 15, 16, 17 years and I've never heard this before. So man, I wanted to find out more. And the main thing which I was happy, the, like the second thing I found out about Islam was that Muslims believe in one God. 
and they did not compromise on that. They believed in Tawheed and they would not budge. They didn't say any of the prophets were part of God. They did not say that God could become a man. They did not say any such thing. And every single religion you will see makes this type of shirk. You will see within Judaism, who claim to be monotheistic, they say, Hanefesh Hayahud, Nefesh Elohim, which means the soul of the Jewish man or woman is the soul of God. They believe that God's soul belongs in them. They believe they are the chosen people. You look within Mormonism. What do the Mormons believe? These people have got a message they think is so great they must come and knock on your door every Sunday morning to wake you up and bother you. They believe that humans actually become God. If you're good, you become God. So they believe the God that they worship at this time used to be a man who used to worship a God who used to be a man. Look at this, how can any sane person believe such a thing? Every religion made shirk somewhere except Islam. And I knew this from the very start. So Alhamdulillah, I began to read more and more about Islam. And like I'd really want to be very sure about this religion. So I read and I read and I read and I read and I read. Even my Muslim friends would come up to me asking for fatwas. They'd say, Musa, are we allowed to do so and so as Muslims? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, in Sahih Bukhari it says this and that. You know, Subhanallah. So I really wanted to be sure I wanted to do justice. Because I didn't want to, you know, jump into a religion only to find something later on that I would reject. So after some time, someone came to me and they gave me a videotape, which was by Brother Abdurrahim Green, about how he embraced Islam. And looking through this, as soon as I'd watched it, I said, man, I agree with everything he's saying, and I can no longer call myself a Christian. Really, the beliefs of the Christians are far too corrupt. So I was like neutral. I wasn't yet Muslim, but I wasn't Christian, alhamdulillah. I was in the middle. And at this time, I began to incorporate the acts of the Muslim worship into my own worship. So when I'd pray, I'd make sajda, because I'd, I'd been in a mosque. I'd seen how the Muslims had prayed. Uh, and I even said, when the month of Ramadan was coming, that I was going to fast for Ramadan. And subhanAllah, I came to my Muslim friends and I said, are you going to fast for Ramadan? And most of them said no. And I said, me, I'm a non-Muslim and I'm going to fast for the whole month of Ramadan. SubhanAllah. And so they all said, okay, we too shall fast, inshallah. And it was during that month that I went to a friend of my house and we used to always break fast there because mashallah, the Muslims always seem to have the nicest food. So food's also a form of da'wah. And uh, subhanAllah, I, he had a massive library of books and I began to read through one which was about the miracles of the Qur'an. And as soon as I had started reading this, like I was glued, I could not stop reading it. And by the time I had finished, like I, what I knew about Islam was the halal, the haram, this and that, the stories of the prophets. But reading about this, this was showing, Allah is saying, this book that I have could be from nobody but Allah. And as soon as I had finished reading it, Alhamdulillah, I said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. And Alhamdulillah, that's basically my story of how I embraced Islam. Uh, so here I'll end, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika, ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.